Hello friends, welcome back. This is Mike Escuti and I'd like to focus on semiconductor quantum dots as well as metal quantum dots in this lecture. So we've covered in an earlier chapter the quantum physics that we need in order to understand semiconductor quantum dots and in a lecture just recently we discussed the uh, plasma resonance and plasma behavior of the permittivity that we'll need to understand metal, uh, metallic quantum dots. So let, we now have everything we need in order to understand this stuff. So let's begin with semiconductor quantum dots and let's focus on a key effect or a key aspect of it. And that is that the size of the quantum dot or if you prefer a quantum well um, greatly influences the band gap. So I hope you remember this from our, our prior discussion, but uh, if, you, if you want to forget all that and just uh, consider this, well, you can... So don't forget all that, but you, you can certainly look at uh, at section 6.7.3 and in summary this uh, of course relates to the fact that if we have a conduction band or a valence band and then separated by a band gap a conduction band um, then we have a band gap in a semiconductor right no surprise here and we can say that this is some kind of delta energy or delta E. If, and let's say that this picture corresponds to a, uh, a, a piece of semiconductor material that's about this big or um, in a cartoony kind of sense, um, this big. And in this diagram then, this is energy, right? So this is a kind of band diagram and we might identify that this uh, quantum dot has this relative uh, band gap here. But what would happen, or what's the comparison, if you have a much smaller quantum dot? Well, in that case, you can draw this yourself. The key difference is then that the band gap is much larger for this smaller quantum dot. And of course, it has to do with the fact that there is a larger surface to volume ratio in this second case on the right. All right, so, um, so this leads to the size dependence. In the same material of things like absorption and emission, behavior of, of both absorption and emission. And, um, and this allows engineers to, uh, to tune. So this allows tuning of both absorption and emission. Um, and the general trend spell that right trend the general trend is simply that there's a blue shift or a shift toward the blue when size becomes smaller so I hope that that kind of makes sense, right? Remember, blue light has more energy than red light. And, and so in our language here, if we compare these two cases, the smaller quantum dot has a larger band gap. And, and so this will shift toward blue wavelengths, both the absorption spectrum and behavior and the emission spectrum and behavior. All right, so we have an example of um, 
a semiconductor quantum dot that's uh, actually very, very common, and this is cadmium selenide. Uh, we also have another example of indium phosphide. So um, these are just two semiconductors, and, uh, and, and they're very, very common. Um, I wanted you to, to, to write them down so that you're familiar with them. And many, many kinds of quantum dots come from those. Now, there's also this aspect of functionalization. And this is a term that's very common in, in, in quantum dots. Um, and this simply means that there is an addition, or it's the process of adding molecules to the outside of the quantum dot. And usually these molecules are organic, flexible, um, for some kind of purpose. And that can take many different, um, uh, de many different purposes that, that we'll get into in later chapters. But what I want to do is, is make sure that you understand what the, um, what the idea is and then just give you one example. So if we have a quantum dot like this, then functionalization would be, uh, could be done by engineers to add some molecules. For example, um, something like the fibers on the outside of a tennis ball. Um, and, uh, and that's done by another synthesis process. And one example of that, uh, of the utility of that, is that if that quantum dot is functionalized just right, then it may bind or connect to a virus in a very special way and connect in such a way that the spectrum or the photonic properties of that quantum dot will change depending on uh, whether there's a virus there or not. So this can be useful to detect um, molecules or, or disease, or it can be useful to actually treat it. And so we'll, we'll focus on that in a later, later lecture. Um, there are many other applications that I'd like to, to highlight of quantum dots. Um, one very common one is sunscreen. And most of us have used this kind of sunscreen with um, titanium dioxide or perhaps zinc oxide, where the absorption of these molecules, uh, I'm sorry, of these, uh, these dots uh, is very high in the ultraviolet, but the absorption is very low in the visible. And, um, and, and so then we get this sun protection without uh, having a, uh, a kind of um, uh, white paste on our skin for example. And these have diameters of around 50 nanometers. So it's really, really powerful and interesting. And absorbs UV, transmits or passes visible light. And of course, the effect is we get sun protection. Um, and there are, of course, many others like photovoltaics, um, light emitting diodes, lasers, uh, many displays use quantum dots uh, for the color filters or in producing color in the display. and. Um, and so we're going to take a brief look at all these just to get a sense. And all of these use semiconductor quantum dots in one way or another. Now, there's a second kind of quantum dot that is very important, and that is the metallic quantum dot. Now, I'd like to talk about metallic quantum dots. These are, of course, just nanoscale particles made of a metallic um, set of atoms. And in this case, confinement causes the plasma to have different damping frequencies, gamma. So that's what we were just talking about in, in, in the recent lecture. And the, the, what happens when the particle size changes is that this damping frequency 
changes. And so the general trend is that smaller particles lead to larger damping frequencies. And this changes what's called the extinction coefficient. And the extinction coefficient is nothing more than simply the, um, the um, I guess, the fraction of light per thickness that is going to be absorbed. Now, if you have a collection of metallic nanoparticles on a film, on a surface, or perhaps even within a, um, a liquid, well, some photons that are going to interact with that are going to transmit straight on through, some are going to absorb, and some are going to scatter. And all of that is in equation 8-9, which I know is complicated, but take a look in your textbook, equation 8-9, and you'll see, most importantly, that this extinction coefficient, which dictates how much is absorbed versus how much is transmitted or even scattered, it, it is a function of the... Most importantly, it's a function of the size of the nanoparticle, as well as the, the real and imaginary parts of the permittivity. And that's the key point here, that as the size of a metallic nanoparticle changes, its absorption changes. And of course, it doesn't have a band gap, so its band gap doesn't change, but its, uh, its absorption changes. So let's look at an example of this. Um, a very important example of this is um, in the biomedical context with gold nanoparticles and also other materials like silver. Now, this is a series of um, vials that have gold nanoparticles within what I think is basically water. And the only thing that's changing in each of these cases is the size of the gold nanoparticle. Um, now, where is this useful? Well, this is useful in enhancing contrast uh, in some cases, especially when they're functionalized. Uh, it, it is also useful in treating certain diseases. And so if you're interested in this, this is a great term paper topic. Now, I want to talk about um, ah, one other uh, example or one other picture here. This is uh, three vials with um, different nanoparticles as well as, uh, as you can see indicated here, different pH values. Now, um, they, the last two slides were pictures of metallic nanoparticles, but I also want to show you what semiconductor nanoparticles look like. And these are actually more brilliant. Um, as you can see here, this is a series of cadmium selenide nanoparticles, or quantum dots, where the only thing that's been changed is the size of the nanoparticle. And, uh, and so you can see the spectrum on the graph for the uh, bottle that is uh, underneath the peak of this spectrum and um, that is uh, right over right over here all right so that green has this very nice saturated spectrum and this is very useful in applications where a saturated color is necessary such as displays and so they're useful in uh, displays but also in LEDs and lighting as well as solar cells and even biomedical sensors. And there's a number of companies that um, are pursuing this and you can see the example uh, picture there where a bunch of nanoparticles are illuminated by UV light and the whole visible range from blue through green to red is, um, is emitting. 